हेलो गेमर्स वेलकम टू ग्लोबल एकेडमी ऑफ मेडिकल एडुकेशन एंड दिस इज डॉक्टर शुनाबो योर ऑप्शन गाइनी फैकल्टी सो टुडे आई विल बी डिस्कसिंग माय मोस्ट फेवरेट टॉपिक इट्स आईनी सेट आईनी सेट इज अ एग्जाम दो इट वाज नॉट देयर व्हेन आई जॉइंड जिपमर बट सिंस इज द गेट वे टू माय इंस्टीट्यूट जिपमर सो इट्स वेरी इमोशनली अटैच्ड टू मी सो विदाउट मच एडो लेट अस स्टार्ट विद द रिव्यू ऑफ द क्वेश्चंस so let us start with the question that uh, was related to endometriosis there are two questions this year on this topic endometriosis and if you have attended my uh, previous sessions if you have attended my previous sessions on um, if you have attended my previous sessions that were aimed to aim for ineset you know by now that endometriosis had undergone recent recent changes which are uh, major changes so this time there was a question which is not a part of medical management and the options were estradiol options were estradiol luprolide luprolide one more option as far as i have collected is medroxy progesterone acetate medroxy progesterone acetate and there was uh, another option so role of luprolide the gnrh gnrh antagonist and the role of gocerelin gocerelin the gnrh agonist the gnrh agonist are undoubtedly there so these two will not be answer as i always say try to rule out the options rather than finding on the correct answer so medroxy progesterone acetate or uh, depo medroxy progesterone acetate injection or even um, a progesterone insert in the form of mirena coil inside the uterus is often used as a hemostatic management in case of endometriosis and also to some extent reduces the lesion the drug of choice these days for uh, endometriosis is a fourth generation progesterone with anti androgenic and immunomodulatory and anti inflammatory effect that is dinogest so uh, what is the role of estradiol in any non pregnant even though endometriosis is a estrogen dependent lesion and estrogen is generally avoided but the standard guidelines say that any non pregnant woman any woman who is not pregnant and having acute menorrhagia or aub acute aub should be treated with iv estrogen it's a different issue that estrogen is not commercially available in iv form in india but that is the drug that is conventionally advised so i don't think estrogen was uh, the part of except so if you find the fourth option i don't know what is the fourth option but that must be the answer because all these three can be used but uh, if you find the if you can recall the fourth option let me know so there was one more question on endometriosis that was a case of dysmenorrhea that was a case of dysmenorrhea and uh, they have mentioned uh, i think bilateral chocolate type of cysts bilateral cysts and adnexal tenderness the woman presented with typical feature of um, endometriosis that is dysmenorrhea dyspareunia dyspareunia so typical features of endometriosis was there and they asked what is the investigation of choice and this is a question i have predicted again and again told you that because previously the main stay of management of endometriosis was surgical the diagnostic confirmatory was diagnostic laparoscopy but recently ashray has changed the guideline and says that there is no need to intervene in case of endometriosis unless the pain is too much or unless clinically so it's the previously it was laparoscopy for all cases of endometriosis mandatory tissue diagnosis has to be obtained now tvs diagnosis tvs diagnosis is considered as the investigation of choice and unless there are certain indications like um, the woman has completed her family or is severely debilitated because of the pain and other symptoms in those cases we can do a surgical removal or if she is going for ivf 
and oocyte retrieval is difficult due to the position of the endometrioma in that case we can remove the endometrioma or drain the endometrioma laparoscopically so these are the only few limited uh, options of surgical management left for endometriosis but otherwise endometriosis the mainstay of diagnosis has become tvs and this is a question which was which would like about to come some day it would have come it was uh, waiting i mean i hope those who have um, attended my class or not attended my class also have got this one correct because this one was a hot favorite for the inies okay so whatever is new is hot favorite for inies because uh, when ine faculties set their paper they look for what are the commonly wrong things in the common lectures and um, you know common materials that students follow so what are wrong there they ask their pgs and set their paper accordingly okay so be careful when what comes recent or what are the common typing mistakes in your um, popular notes or books anyway so uh, next there is a question on hormone replacement therapy so before hormone replacement therapy you just know that uh, do you know the ceo right ceo thing ceo is the cancers that are prevented by ocp so what a ceo colon colon ovary and endometrium and endometrium and that is because these are low concentration estrogen and progesterone working there so on the other hand hrt is actually high concentration estrogen and progesterone so in that situation the ovary and is uh, the endometrium especially the endometrium if we give an hrt with um, e plus p that is with progesterone if you don't give an hrt with progesterone so unopposed estrogen causes endometrial cancer so that was one option it increases uh, endometrial cancer which is true it also increases ca breast it also increases ca breast remember ocp is neutral for ca breast and hrt i'm just comparing ocp versus uh, hrt so ca breast is neutral for ocp but increased by hrt and um, one more option i think was it uh, decreases osteoporosis is decreases osteoporosis which one is a, a true statement which one is a true statement and uh, one more option uh, the as per as i have collected is it reduces the incidence of colon cancer it reduces the incidence of colon cancer which is true which is true for both ocp and hrt so i have collected only the gist of the options incorrect or true whatever they asked or what they didn't ask i don't know so i gave you the true facts it increases risk of endometrial cancer increases the risk of ca breast reduces osteoporosis and um, bone decay protects the heart and reduces colon cancer so these are the facts and you can uh, i mean arrange your questions accordingly so um, coming to one uh, question that was on turner syndrome the question was on turner syndrome i will not go into uh, details of this question because this is actually uh, i have discussed with our pediatric faculty as well so what are the routine tests that we don't do cardiac evaluation cardiac evaluation i think audiometry which is done for pretty much every symptomatic baby when they present as a child and then uh, ogtt and uh, there was another option which is ana anti nuclear antibody so anti nuclear antibody is not done routinely and that is the answer to that question uh, there is let us discuss one obstetric question so this question was one of the most tricky questions of this paper so i'll give you the options the options were cmv herpes simplex virus i think hep b or hiv i am not sure either hep b or hiv and rubella so the question is all four are diseases that are vertically transmitted vertically transmitted energy from mother to the progeny right from mother to progeny 
so the question was actually not on vertical transmission the question was on perinatal transmission perinatal transmission so let us understand what is a vertical transmission vertical transmission is any transformation from transmission from the mother to the baby so it can happen when the baby is in utero through the placenta through the placenta it can happen during during birth during birth like through the birth canal or vaginal canal and it can happen after birth as well postpartum period through breast milk through breast milk right so these are the three modalities now the one during birth is actually known as perinatal so herpes simplex herpes simplex definitely is uh, herpes simplex is definitely carried by the uh, i mean transmitted through the birth canal hiv hpv both are transmitted through birth canal and cytomegalovirus can also be transmitted through birth canal but not rubella rubella is classically a first trimester infection rubella is classically a first trimester intrauterine uh, infection and hence our answer to this question will be rubella okay so um, let us come to a question on um, genital development there are a few questions about genital development uh, i mean gonadal developments and all so let us start with the most basic question that was asked so that was on primary amenorrhea primary amenorrhea they asked the very definition of primary amenorrhea and remember ini exams need also but ini exam is notorious for asking very basic very primary question so let's just recap what is the definition of primary amenorrhea i hope all of you have got it correct so amenorrhea without um, any secondary sexual characteristics till 15 years of age or when presence of secondary sexual characteristics till 13 year of age is considered as uh, primary amenorrhea so uh, there was this question on um disorders of sexual differentiation disorder of sexual disorders dsd this is my personal favorite topic so there was two questions i think one was a statement kind of question so the statements were dihydrotestosterone is responsible for development for male external genitalia which is a true statement another was mullerian inhibitory factor is what is responsible for regression of the mullerian system in the male regression of female structure regression of female line in male which is also correct statement uh there was another question i think um, wolfian duct wolfian duct wolfian duct is there for the male internal genitalia male internal genitalia i think it's very basic you all know but still i will present you with mnemonic so here it is a little bit confusing mullerian is in women mullerian is for the female genital uh, formation whereas wolfian wolfian is for the male internal genitals right so this is opposites um, you know it's just the opposites so i think another question was in the area of sexual dimorphism or at what age uh, gonads are developed uh, it's um, it was a bit on the uh, in the number i didn't get correct and it is good to remember all those numbers because they are often asked but um, you know if ines set a paper they don't want to test your cramming ability your uh, ratifying ability so they have given three options which you can easily rule out from your basic knowledge and then the fourth option which over uh, was there was the incorrect option that was asked uh, the another question on dst was it's a case of uh, primary amenorrhea it was a case of primary amenorrhea now they have given straight away the karyotype they have straight away given the karyotype they have told clitoromegaly 
clitoromegaly. Then they have said androgen level high, androgen high, and they have given some, I think, prepubertal breast, prepubertal breast and tanner to tanner to pubic hair. So the options were, I think, um, complete AIS, AIS incomplete, then uh, 5 alpha reductase, and uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So remember if you are seeing a primary amenorrhea, if you are seeing a primary amenorrhea, oh yes there was blind vagina, blind vagina. So what I taught you the basic um, algorithm. So if you see blind vagina, if you see if someone has a blind vagina, if there is if there is pubic hair, if there is pubic hair and if there is pubic, no adrenergy, no pubic hair, right? If there is no pubic hair, it is Muller, Rokitansky, Kastner, Hauser and it will be XX. On the other hand, if pubic hair is there, it is either, sorry, if, um, If pubic hair is not there, if pubic hair is not there, it is andro and um, androgen insensitivity syndrome and pubic hair is there, it is Muller, Rokitansky, Kastner, Hauser. Now androgen insensitivity syndrome is XY and MRKH is XX. So MRKH is ruled out. So here what you can see is blind vagina, pubic hair along with XY. So this is our atypical case 5 alpha reductase. This is our 5 alpha reductase. This is a feminized female. Sorry, a feminized male. Feminized male. Due to the absence of uh, 5 alpha reductase. So don't just see clitoromegaly and jump into CAH. CAH will have other features as I think we have discussed many times. So let us uh, come to one of our andrology questions. Let us come to one of the andrology questions. So there was one question where semen analysis, semen analysis had no fructose semen analysis has no fructose and fructose we all know comes from seminal vesicles comes from seminal vesicles so it is a obstruction at the level of seminal vesicles now as the gynecological organs the uterus and all are best seen if you put the usg probe directly on the fornix of the uh, on the fornix of the vagina so from there you can get the closest and get the best image. So if you want to see seminal vesicles, it's a very small delicate structure. So you need to get as close as possible and that is the only way to do it is the endoluminal sonography, endoluminal sonography or endoluminal ultrasound and for males the only access is rectum. So we have to go for a transrectal ultrasound to understand at uh, what level is the block because it is somewhere um, distal to the seminal vesicles or the ejaculatory draft right so i think there was uh, one obstetric question which is again that some things are there to confuse you so if you keep your mind straight and uh, carefully see the question you will not mess up that question was non-immune high drops non-immune high drops if you have attended my classes and other tnd sessions 
you have seen a huge list i have taken like you know the williams textbook is like this big and the two pages the entire two pages lists out uh, the causes of non immune high drops and also in jipmer this was one of our you know one of those questions which would be asked in rounds every alternative day every alternate day some consultant will ask the interns the pgs that what are the causes of non immune high drops so that list is a long list and basically anything genetic anything congenital or any abnormality any um, growth anything can lead to uh, non immune high drops but what you should know is you cannot list remember all the non immune high drops so you should understand what are the immune high drops and immune high drops is what is all about blood incompatibilities blood incompatibilities maybe abo maybe rh maybe kel duffy all the uncommon uh, antibodies i mean antigen antibodies so that you should understand so there was many causes which you may not know but if i am not wrong abo was an answer and abo is basically what is abo rh kel duffy all these are basically the immune high drops so if abo is there in that option that was definitely incorrect that was definitely incorrect so another question um, it was asked i will not uh, go into much details of the uh, question so i think they have asked uh, they have given a picture like this and asked um, it was a picture of a clue cell definitely and as much as i have gathered that they asked what what is a type what is the structure like is it the bacteria itself or is it a trophozoite form of a protozoa or a cyst form of a protozoa so this clue cell is basically epithelial cell basically epithelial cell of the vagina started with numerous started with numerous organisms started with numerous organisms and this is seen in bacterial vaginosis this is seen in bacterial vaginosis so just quickly recap that is another of my favorite topics so quickly recap the three um, vaginitis one is bacterial vaginosis one is trichomonas vaginalis one is candida one is candida so bacterial vaginosis very simple we'll see these features each smell color each smell color that's all that's all you will see so if there is um, bacterial vaginosis bacterial vaginosis is usually non itchy there is smell which is more prominent on whiff test color is grayish color is grayish thin trichomonas vaginalis trichomonas vaginalis is definitely itchy it causes so much inflammation that it leads to strawberry vagina trichomonas vaginalis usually have foul smell too color is greenish greenish frothy greenish frothy this is gay grayish thin discharge and what about candida candida does not uh, candida does not cause smell but candida causes each candida does not cause smell but candida definitely causes each and it is cardi white cardi white right so if you see a discharge which has each which which is presenting with each which is grayish thin or greenish frothy or cardi white either smelly or itchy or both then it is an infection and on this specific point on the same topic that i have highlighted in a, like one of the 5 6 recorded high yield topic i could do for any set one of them was vaginal infection right so if you have gone through that you will know that all these are abnormal feature so what is a normal feature normal vector uh, discharge is thin white or transparent it is acidic because normal ph of the vagina is acidic so the, that is because of this substance only the discharge material so it is acidic and that explains why uh, for normal discharge also the underwears get stained yellow if it is a 
pale colored underwear it will get yellow stained and if it is a dark color underwear it will get faded off the color will get faded off so if somebody in your clinical practice also somebody comes and tells you that i'm having this discharge which is discoloring my underwear like turning my white underwears yellow and black underwears uh, faded why um, kind of thing so that is absolutely normal so anything that is thin white or transparent acidic and non itchy non itchy non foul smelling is healthy normal vaginal discharge healthy normal vaginal discharge right and that will have plenty of daughter lins bacilli plenty of daughter lins bacilli or simply lactobacilli lactobacilli so the point is if you practice too much of excessive internal hygiene specifically with alkaline materials like soap the acid gets neutralized also if you do not use if you used um, like multiple commercial ph balance materials are available i don't want to take name at this platform so if you use those substances still you are washing off the good bacteria and you are opening the faucet for the opportunistic pathogens which were not being able to colonize the vagina because the healthy normal guardians were present now if you wash them off there will be opportunistic infection and we will get a picture like this a clusel suggestive of bacterial vaginosis bacterial vaginosis is a disease of hygiene right it's a disease of hygiene okay uh, there was one more question which was not related to i thought i will discuss it with endometriosis itself and i thought we will discuss later so primary versus secondary dysmenorrhea primary versus secondary dysmenorrhea so there is actually uh, primary versus secondary dysmenorrhea is primary dysmenorrhea is somebody a woman who has painful periods from her from the beginning of her um, menarche and secondary dysmenorrhea is somebody who has developed later in the life so the question that i saw i read from uh, different um, sources is the question was on primary versus secondary dysmenorrhea but the options that came to me are the options were like they were discussing spasmodic versus congestive dysmenorrhea i mean i agree that most of the secondary dysmenorrhea are congestive whereas most of the primary dysmenorrhea are spasmodic but you cannot just uh, you know linearly connect these two anyway spasmodic dysmenorrhea is because the and since which is why it is uh, the mostly seen in primary dysmenorrhea it is because the blood irritates the outflow tract and the outflow tract goes into spasm so it starts with the period starts with the period stays for 2 3 days when the flow is more and goes off after that and usually once the goes off permanently after baby after first baby because a uh, first baby is in first vaginal delivery because at vaginal delivery the cervix is totally opened and the spasm is permanently removed and if you go back a little bit in time like when we were in mbbs students we used to say that the treatment for this kind of dysmenorrhea is serial cervical um, dilatation to relieve the spasm but um, nobody does that anymore and it's like um, no it's all gone historic so the primary management of spasmodic dysmenorrhea are nsaids nsaids on the other hand if you see congestive dysmenorrhea congestive dysmenorrhea is either because the uterus has come become retroverted from its normal position or there is a fibroid or there is adenomyosis or there is some reason which is pulling more blood than usual so during the proliferative phase and the luteal phase there is a pelvic congestion so the there is more blood accumulation more blood flow more congestion at the pelvis and the pelvic feel uh, the pelvis feels heavy and painful so this kind of pain starts before period starts before period and goes off goes off with flow 
so the first day the blood flows the congestion gets relieved and this kind of pain goes uh, down so the treatment for this kind of uh, dysmenorrhea is uh, the spasmolytics like drotaverine drotaverine or uh, dicyclomine so this is the uh, difference remember most of the congestive dysmenorrhias are i mean second most of the secondary dysmenorrhias are congestive and most of the primary dysmenorrhias are spasmodic but the definitions are not equivalent primary secondary is a different definition spasmodic congestive is a different definition and there is a third entity in this is a triple dysmenorrhea triple dysmenorrhea which is the worst of all which is seen in endometriosis because because of the endometriotic deposits the cervix cannot dilate properly so there is spasmodic type because of pelvic congestion there is the congestive type and even after the period is over the spillage the retrograde menstruation the retrograde menstruation that has happened within the pelvis the blood that has gone into the pelvis will irritate the peritoneum till it gets completely absorbed and uh, form fibrosis so the pain will trail even after the period is over like it will be coming before the period comes basically and after that the period when it happens it will be painful and even once the period is over it will still be painful right so this is the worst kind of uh, dysmenorrhea and that is triple dysmenorrhea so um, there was one question from tifa tifa i have not discussed in my classes in details because tifa is anomaly scan or level 2 scan is the other name of anomaly scan or level 2 scan or targeted imaging for fetal anomalies so there was a cerebral banana sign and i think your uh, radiology faculty will discuss that with thorough images and comparing with other images so i would uh, rather skip this question so there was one question on pelvic organ prolapse so another question on pelvic organ prolapse a particularly uh, favorite topic of uh, both aims and gipmer because both these institutes have a very dedicated i mean even pga also so all these three institutes have a very dedicated urogynecology unit and urogynecology is like ignored in many places but um, INES mostly will have specialist urogynecology units and so all these pelvic organ prolapse, uro flow, uh, urine issues, uh, incontinences, all these questions are more prominent for, more important for your INE exams. So it was a list I think, vault prolapse, there was, uh, it was to be matched, vault prolapse, uterine, uh, uterovaginal prolapse, cystocil and rectocil so basically the four variants so is one more enterocil enterocil is the prolapse of pod by the way not um, enteric content okay and the options were sacrospinous fixation sacrospinous fixation uh, this option will come a bit later uh, colpo suspension colpo suspension and for rectocil it was uh, colpoperineurophy colpoperineurophy also called posterior colpoperineurophy it's basically posterior only if you are doing a colpoperineurophy so posterior colpoperineurophy so rectocil definitely it's a posterior fascial defect so it is a <coughs> the surgery is posterior colpoperineurophy for cystocil the surgery is anterior perineurophy Cystocil, the surgery is anterior perineurophy, whereas colpo suspension is the surgery for either vault prolapse, either vault prolapse, or most commonly it is the surgery done for ACUI. Barch colpo suspension, laparoscopic or open, is considered as the gold standard surgery for stress urinary incontinence. So this is a wrong match, definitely a wrong match. Vault prolapse, acrospinous fixation again is a correct match. So, you have to find the wrong answers. Then you will automatically reach the right answer. Now if you have ruled out three options confidently, then you know that the fourth has to be the correct answer. The reverse is not true. If you have marked 
the correct answer correctly then your uh, chance is 25 percent unless it's a very seater question of course but we were of the seater questions as well they are uh, they are mostly to fool you not to help you score marks so here we have now uterovaginal prolapse vaginal hysterectomy is actually not the surgical procedure that is required the surgical procedure that is required is pelvic floor repair so vaginal hysterectomy with pelvic floor repair is considered as the surgery of choice if there is if the woman wants to maintain her surgery we can do a manchester or we can do only pfr only pelvic floor repair that is anterior colporaphy plus posterior colporaphy plus plication of the uterus actals and macken rods basically strengthening the delancy's three levels of supports but uterus has come out but it's an innocent organ removing the uterus per se is not a treatment of course if we remove the uterus the surgery becomes very easy and most of the women that comes with this kind of problems uterovaginal prolapse are like uh, para 4 para 5 life 5 and they are 60 60 plus so um, they also do not much keen on keeping their uterus with them and removing the uterus makes the surgery and the surgeon's life really easy so classically since the time of ward mayo it has been considered as a single surgery vaginal hysterectomy plus pfr but today is the era of preserve the uterus it's the woman's choice whether she wants to get her uterus removed or not even if she is p9 l9 and 85 right so if a woman wants to preserve her uterus there is a surgery excellent surgery called hysteropexy where we wrap a mesh around the uterus and suspend the uterus strengthening the pelvic floor keeping um, you know lifting the pelvic floor contents from coming out so vaginal hysterectomy per se is not a correct answer unless they have given the option of pfr so if pfr was given then this is definitely a correct match and this has to be the wrong answer but if pfr was not there even then this is more wrong than this because vaginal hysterectomy is classically done in case of a uterine prolapse but if you do only vaginal hysterectomy and not pfr properly then soon the when the uterine prolapse will be corrected it will convert into a ward prolapse so i'm uh, comment under uh, this post and let me know whether pfr was clubbed with the vh or was the option was ward mayo or something like that <coughs> So um, coming to our initial discussions on amenorrhea, I think this year amenorrhea was one of the hit topics. They have asked multiple questions on it and um, they have asked the two questions. Most common cause of amenorrhea in puberty, most common cause, direct question kind of I think as much as I heard, most common cause in puberty, in puberty, amenorrhea and heavy menstrual bleeding or dysmenorrhea or puberty menorrhagia puberty menorrhagia is an old term it's not uh, used anymore but it's okay we can i mean we use it for all practical purposes so the reason is gonadal dysgenesis most common reason is gonadal dysgenesis and remember gonadal dysgenesis in most cases are idiopathic idiopathic there are certain genetic abnormalities there are certain genetic abnormalities which are associated with gonadal dysgenesis but pure gonadal dysgenesis is mostly idiot idiopathic right and pure gonadal dysgenesis is definitely most common cause of um, primary amenorrhea primary amenorrhea so a pubertal girl who comes with primary amenorrhea most common cause is well on the other hand hmb most common cause is an anovulatory cycle an ovulatory cycle 
and that comes with a typical history you know i will describe it for you so they will have heavy bleeding suddenly then period i mean bleeding free period for certain time then again there's some bleeding mild spotting for through till they stopped then again after 7 8 days sudden heavy bleeding with major clots so what basically happens is that hypothalamus pituitary ac- ovarian axis is not developed in the first 2 3 years of um, pubertal life so what happens is there is no ovulation there is no ovulation because immaturity of the axis the failure of lh trigger so there is no ovulation so since there is no ovulation there is no corpus luteum and hence no progesterone and estrogen causes unopposed growth of the endometrium so endometrium is now uh, growing and so are the blood vessels the spiral arteries of the endometrium now at one point of time this endometrium is growing this endometrium is growing relentlessly like this like this like this and then they, there is a limit to the spinal arteries right so the spinal arteries cannot reach maybe beyond this point so this area gets necrosed and shed and if you consider this as the whole uterus this is the endometrial cavity and this is the endometrium so this phenomena is not happening at all places at the same time so what can happen is suppose this area gets necrosed and then falls off maybe then this small area gets necrosed after 2 3 days and falls off so there is spotting and then suddenly this entire part gets necrosed and falls so suddenly heavy bleeding so very irregular very erratic if you see in your clinical practice this kind of a picture and this is also the same pathology is there in pco as well so if you see this same kind of pathology is there in case of pco as well and hence the this is the typical bleeding pattern of pco as well so basically if you see an anovulatory cycle this will be the typical bleeding pattern and the second most common is the bleeding disorders and blood cancers the blood dyscrasias so you need to really really work her up if this kind of a girl comes even if there is this typical history we need to really really work her up with coagulation profile and a very detailed um, peripheral blood smear so uh, talking of pco there was this question i think this was a bit of controversy among yourselves though i think this was a simple question so there is this pco woman who is um infertile for quite some time it's a primary infertility she has never conceived i think for 5 years or something she has was trying to conceive so it's a long time i mean there is i mean this long duration proves that there is no point of uh, you know uh wait and watch kind of thing some intervention has to be given so the options i think i had bmi was i think 40 so bmi 40 is like morbid obesity so options were like what is the first step in the management and the options were weight loss clomiphene citrate clomiphene plus weight loss and um, i think fsh induction was one of the options i as much as i have collected so what i'm pretty sure from all my sources is letrozole letrozole was not an option and if you see the pco if you see the antral follicular count pco is this kind of picture like many follicles are ready to be mature so if you give trigger they will all mature at the same time right and that will lead to a very deadly condition called yes ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome so to prevent ohss we do not give cc for pco cases if you have to give anything we give letrozole which causes single ovulation single ovulation induction so this is single ovulation induction or controlled ovulation induction cc is multiple ovulation induction multiple ovulation induction so cc is a drug that is generally for i mean for at least your exam purposes cc is not given in pco in fact the specialists give them in a very monitored and special setups in certain cases but for practical purposes exam purposes mcq purposes cc if you see that is gone gone and gone so 
they have asked you what is the first intervention. So the first intervention is definitely weight loss because FSH is a second generation agent. So it could be weight loss plus letrozole. It could be. It could be letrozole alone because she has been trying to losing weight for six months. So I don't think uh, it, there is any reason that to ask her like you wait, lose weight and you come back and then she cannot lose weight and she goes to another doctor and then that person. So if she cannot lose weight, we have to do something, right? So the first line ovulation induction agent, ovul and ovulation is the primary problem for um, PCO. So we have to give ovulation induction and that ovulation induction has to be retrozole. That is the first line drug, not CC, not CC at all. So CC wala options are gone. And that leaves us with a second line ovulation induction agent, which is definitely not a very good answer at this point of time and weight loss. So our best answer is weight loss in this question. That is uh, my opinion. Um, or just as I told, there is already uh, some controversy regarding the question. So of course, INES will not come up with a specific answer. So. I don't know, but this is my explanation, my take on this question as a um, practicing consultant. Also, I would go with, I would agree with this. Okay, so there was one more, there was one more question, which is like classical presentation of uterine fibroid uterine fibroid so uterine fibroid can undergo several kind of degeneration one is dystrophic calcification dystrophic calcification which presents as a the, the entire fibroid gets calcified and it presents as a warm stone warm stone it looks like a bladder stone but it is basically a uterine fibroid which has become a stone so that is a warm stone then it can undergo um, degeneration malignant transformation malignant transformation which is less than one person one specific kind of uh, degeneration that these can undergo is red degeneration which is basically congestive necrosis of the which is basically a congestive necrosis congestive necrosis of the fibroid and typically seen in pregnancy typically seen in pregnancy so it presents with this classical triad of pain severe pain i have seen many cases in my residency like so presence with severe pain i mean there will be toxic look you will think there is an infection going on or a sepsis going on or something is going on but um, it's, it's a red degeneration of fibroid so there will be severe pain there will be fever and i mean this will look absolutely like sepsis unless you know or do a scan and see there is the fibroid if you have a baseline scan and you know that she is a known case of fibroid and i think in your question also it was given that she is a known case of fibroid uterus with pregnancy so pain fever and um, Pain, fever and increased white white cell count. Pain, fever and increased white cell count is the typical triad of red degeneration and Rx of red degeneration is aspirin. Aspirin not in the preeclampsia preventing dose but the full pain killing dose, right? So this is the triad of red degeneration, pain, fever and increased WCC, I mean white cell count which is absolutely mimicking asepsis unless this history is given or some image is provided to you to see or some clinical findings suggestive of fibroid if you see this triad you will definitely you should mark sepsis but if they talk about a fibroid then it's a red degeneration and uh, the treatment of choice for this um, treatment of choice for this condition is basically treatment of choice for this condition is basically aspirin aspirin not to be given in the therapeutic dose aspirin not to be given in the uh, i mean the prophylactic dose that is given for preeclampsia 
but the pen killing dose the NSAID dose of aspirin right that is more than 325 milligram per day so I think with this we have uh, covered all our object questions so if I have missed any question if you want clarification on some other question uh, do let me know under the pinned comment or you can um, send a message to my instagram account which is dr shunavo or you can follow me on my facebook account which is my name is u n a b h a g h o s h no space no doctor nothing or at dr shunavo which is my insta account which is my insta account or this is my facebook account and do follow the facebook instagram page and join the telegram and facebook group of uh, global academy of medical education so as i always say let's play the game all the best and i wish to meet all of you in INES. thank you